This video is sponsored by Storyblocks. WhatsApp is the most popular messaging app in the world, valued at over $1.5 billion. 100 billion messages are sent each day on the app by over 2 billion active users. And it all started with a Ukrainian immigrant who dropped out of college and lost both his parents. Growing up with little money and no support, he worked as a janitor before learning how to code and becoming a hacker. When he started WhatsApp, he had no choice but to work in a cold office, clinging onto blankets for warmth and on cheap IKEA tables. On February 24, 1976, Jan Kum was born to a Jewish family in Kyiv, Ukraine, then part of the Soviet Union, and was raised in Fastiv, a city that was only a couple of hours away. His mother was a housewife, and his father was a government construction manager. Growing up, Jan didn't see much of his father, since work kept him out late until 10 p.m. Still, his father held an attitude that would leave a mark on him starting from a young age. Get sh done at any cost. The Kums' everyday life in Ukraine was extremely restricted. Their house had no hot water, and they rarely spoke on the phone out of fear that the state was listening to their conversations. His school didn't even have an indoor bathroom, so Jan and the other kids would have to walk across the parking lot to use one, even when the temperature dropped below freezing. Still, Jan enjoyed the rural lifestyle. However, he wouldn't stay there for long. No doubt it might have been possible to avoid many mistakes, to have done much in a better way. When Jan turned 16, the Soviet Union collapsed. I wish all of you the very best. As the dust was settling, the Jewish populations of many of the reeling Soviet nations fled persecution. Jan's family among them. Jan's mother fled to the U.S., taking Jan and his grandmother with her. The family settled in Mountain View, California, except for Jan's father, who fell ill and couldn't join them. Left to raise Jan without his father, Jan's mother got a small two-bedroom apartment through government assistance and took work as a babysitter. However, the money she earned wasn't enough to get by, and the two were left waiting in the long lines outside the North County Social Services office to collect food stamps. Not long after, Jan received devastating news. His mother had been diagnosed with cancer. Still a teenager, Jan started working as a janitor at a grocery store to support his sick mother. By the time Jan was 18, he had developed a reputation as a troublemaker at school. He spoke little English and had a tendency to retaliate against people who tried to bully him. Still, Jan wasn't disinterested in academics. In fact, he had a strong passion for learning and was particularly interested in computer programming. Before we get into the next part of the story, we would like to thank our sponsor Storyblocks. Using Storyblocks, we've enhanced how we bring our stories to life without sacrificing our vision because of time, budget, and resources. Storyblocks Unlimited All Access Plan made it extremely easy to create compelling scenes through its vast and diverse library of motion backgrounds, special effects, and after effects templates. Plus, we were able to make them even more engaging with high quality production music, sound effects, and stock video. Whether you're a new or expert freelancer, influencer, or digital marketer, Storyblocks makes it easier to grab your audience's attention and get the views, clicks, and shares you want. And unlike traditional stock sites that limit content with a pay-per-clip model, Storyblocks gives you unlimited royalty-free downloads of HD footage, 4K footage, music and sound effects, photos, vectors, illustrations, and more. Create more engaging videos faster than ever before. Try out Storyblocks today by going to storyblocks.com forward slash hook. Through manuals from a used bookstore, Jan managed to teach himself about computer networking, the process of connecting computers and devices together through specialized devices like routers. 
Once he was done with the books, he'd return them to the store. Yan later joined the elite hacking group WooWoo, Woo, the self-described largest non-profit security team in the world at the time. Many of its members would later become well-known in the tech industry, among them Napster co-founder Sean Fanning. He learned about cybersecurity from them and took those lessons with him throughout his career. After barely graduating from Mountain View High School, Jan enrolled in the San Jose State University's computer science program. While he studied, Jan worked on the side as a security tester for Ernst & Young. While working there, Jan befriended a Yahoo employee named Brian Acton thanks to his no-nonsense style, not hesitating to ask questions like, What are your policies here? What are you doing here? Likewise, Brian impressed Jan since, Neither of us has an ability to bullshit. Six months later, Jan landed a job as an infrastructure engineer at Yahoo. At the time, Yahoo was a web directory startup competing with Google that had been founded three years prior. Two weeks into the job, one of Yahoo's servers broke, and Yahoo's co-founder David Philo called Jan for help. I'm in class, Jan responded. What the f are you doing in class? demanded Philo. Get your a into the office. Jan dropped out of college. I hated school anyway, he later admitted. Over the next few years, Jan found himself dealing with more than just server issues. His father had passed away in Ukraine the same year he had met Brian, and his mother succumbed to her cancer three years later. It was Brian who got him through this difficult time. Brian made sure that Jan didn't feel alone by inviting Jan over to his house and bringing him out to play sports, with Ultimate Frisbee becoming a popular activity for the two. As Yahoo grew, both Jan and Brian began to question their future at the company. Brian was emotionally drained from working on Yahoo's advertising platform to the point where Jan could see it when they were in the halls. After years, the two quit and traveled South America and played more Ultimate Frisbee. When the two returned a year later, they applied for jobs at Facebook but were rejected. Brian then tried his luck at Twitter but was rejected once more. Afterward, Brian started to think about pursuing his own startup ideas. Meanwhile, Jan wasn't sure about what he'd do next, but it would still take some time for something to come along and give him an idea. Jan had been living off his savings since leaving Yahoo, and a year after he returned to the US, inspiration struck. Jan had bought a new iPhone and realized that the 7-month-old App Store was about to introduce a whole new industry of apps. He came up with the idea of an app that would allow the people in his contact list to see his status next to his name, like if he was on a call, at the gym, or if his battery was low. Jan settled on the name WhatsApp almost immediately after deciding to build the app since it sounded like What's Up? Only one week later, WhatsApp was incorporated. Jan worked on the backend code while a developer he met through a friend, Igor Solominikov, did the heavy lifting on iOS. Jan wanted WhatsApp to sync with any phone number in the world, so he poured over a Wikipedia article looking up every international dialing prefix and spent months in frustration working out regional dialing nuances. When Jan demoed the app to friends, he received a cold response. The app crashed, got stuck, and drained the iPhone's battery. Only a handful of friends on his contact list ended up using the app. Enjoying the video so far? Be sure to like this video, subscribe to Hook, and ring the bell to get notifications about more videos on industry leaders. A month later, Jan was losing hope. I should probably fold up and start looking for a job, Jan admitted to Brian after a game of Ultimate Frisbee together. Brian balked at Jan's plans. You'd be an idiot to quit now, he said. Give it a few more months. Jan took Brian's advice, and a few months later, Apple implemented a feature that changed everything. 
Apple launched push notifications on iPhone, which allowed developers for iOS to ping users even when they weren't using an app. Jan incorporated push notifications into WhatsApp, pinging his friends each time he changed his status. The feature was an instant hit. When it went live, Jan's friends started to ping each other with custom statuses like, I woke up late, or I'm on the way. Watching his friends send statuses back and forth, Jan realized that he had inadvertently created a messaging app. One with great potential given that it could theoretically work with any phone number in the world. Being able to reach somebody halfway across the world instantly on a device that is always with you was powerful, Jan explained. Jan shifted development, officially making a fully-fledged messaging service, something he wished he could have used to keep in touch with family when younger. At the time, the only other free texting service around was BlackBerry's BBM, but that only worked among BlackBerrys. While there were messengers like Gtalk and Skype, those were more focused on desktop than mobile and required users to make an account with their email instead of being able to log in with their phone number. Two months later, Jan submitted WhatsApp 2.0 to the Apple Store, and it went live a couple weeks later. This version allowed users to send messages back and forth to each other directly, instead of just pinging one another in status updates. It also introduced the famous double check mark. One check mark appeared next to a message to confirm it had been sent, and another appeared to confirm it had been read. Jan watched as WhatsApp's user base quickly grew from a handful to 250,000. His next step was to get in touch with Brian. The two sat at Brian's kitchen table and sent messages back and forth to each other. Brian recognized the potential WhatsApp had to deliver a richer SMS experience to users than its competitors. He was on board. At first, the two worked from tables on the second floor of Red Rock Coffee, a Mountain View cafe with a reputation of being a community hub in Silicon Valley. A month later, Brian secured $250,000 in funding for the fledging app by getting five of his ex-Yahoo friends to invest. As a result, Jan gave him co-founder status and gave him a share of the company. Brian officially joined a month later. The potential of WhatsApp wasn't lost on their users either. At the time, the pair was being flooded with emails from iPhone users excited by free international texting and desperate to get in touch with their friends on Nokia's or Blackberries. With Android still a minor player in the market, Jan decided that BlackBerry was the best platform to expand onto. So he contacted an old friend, a BlackBerry developer named Chris Pfeiffer, to lead WhatsApp's charge onto the platform. Chris was skeptical. People have SMS, right? He asked. Jan explained that text messages were measured and charged in different countries. It's a dead technology, Jan continued like a fax machine left over from the 70s, sitting there as a cash cow for carriers. Jan then showed Chris WhatsApp's user growth. Chris was hooked. The next month, WhatsApp was updated to let users send photos. The month after that, it launched on BlackBerry, and seven months after that, Android. WhatsApp was growing, and working from tables at a coffee shop was no longer an option. Eventually, Jan and Brian decided to expand and use their former Yahoo connections to sublease some cubicles in a converted warehouse in Mountain View. The workspace wasn't glamorous. They worked off cheap IKEA tables and had to wear blankets for warmth. But such conditions were the least of their problems. Just like their users had experienced before them, WhatsApp was dealing with the price of text messaging. Verification texts were costing the company and draining Jan's bank account. Even using cutthroat text messaging services like Clickatel, who charged two cents for a text message to the United States, international texts raised that price. For example, texts sent to the Middle East cost up to 65 cents. In order to keep costs low, Jan and Brian would resort to occasionally switching WhatsApp from being a free app to a paid one in an attempt to limit growth, charging a one-time fee of 99 cents. But even then, WhatsApp continued to grow.
One year later, WhatsApp had climbed the ranks to become one of the top 20 apps in the App Store. But for Jan and Brian, it was business as usual. Yet, unlike most companies, business as usual meant no advertising. During a staff lunch, someone chimed up and asked Jan why they weren't going to the press about their success. Jan's response summed up his view on advertising. Marketing and press kicks up dust, Jan explained. It gets in your eye, and then you're not focusing on the product. Besides, WhatsApp didn't need the advertising. People could tell that it was big. It was going viral, and venture capitalists wanted in on that virality. They tried to meet with Jan and Brian, but both of them shut down every single request. Brian saw venture capital as a bailout and wasn't interested, but one investor wasn't so easily dissuaded. Jim Getz, a partner at venture capital firm Sequoia, had met with other messaging companies, but none of them had the same impressive growth as WhatsApp. He was even more impressed when he discovered that they were already paying corporate income tax. It was the first time he had seen that in his venture career. Jim saw what Jan and Brian were working on, and he wanted in. He spent eight months working on his contacts just to get a chance to sit down with the two founders. When he finally succeeded, the three sat down where it all began, Red Rock Coffee. Then, Jan and Brian unleashed a torrent of questions upon him. He promised not to push ads into their business model, something both Jan and Brian were adamant about. They wanted to keep WhatsApp as a service that people used because it saved them money and made their lives better, even if it was just in a small way. Dealing with ads at Yahoo was depressing. Brian later explained, you don't make anyone's life better by making advertisements work better. Jim offered to act as a strategic advisor for the two and not interfere with how they ran the company. Jan and Brian took his word and accepted an $8 million investment from Sequoia. Eight months later, WhatsApp had grown to over 50 million active users, a 400% increase compared to a year prior. Nine months later, WhatsApp introduced encryption so that messages sent through the app were no longer in plain text. Seven months after that, WhatsApp grew to 200 million active users, overtaking Twitter. It wasn't only WhatsApp's user base that had grown though. The company itself now had 50 employees and Brian wanted to make sure they never had to worry about making payroll. He'd seen what the stress had done to his mother when she ran a business and lost sleep over making sure everyone got paid. And even though they had more than Sequoia had invested, he and Jan decided to raise more funds, this time in secret. Sequoia came in with another 50 million, valuing WhatsApp at 1.5 billion and making WhatsApp part of the Unicorn Club, an independently owned startup worth over 1 billion. Two months later, it had reached 250 million users. Two months after that, WhatsApp introduced voice messages and attracted another 50 million users, despite introducing a yearly subscription fee of 99 cents. And just as WhatsApp had caught the attention of Jim before, now they attracted the attention of the largest social media network in the world. Facebook predicted that WhatsApp was on track to connect 1 billion people and offered to buy them out for 19 billion, the largest sum they had ever offered to a company. When Mark Zuckerberg made the offer, Jan asked Brian for his opinion. Brian replied, I like Mark, we can work together. Let's make this deal. Overnight, the two became billionaires. It seemed a strange agreement given Jan's notorious hatred of advertising and Facebook's entire business model being built on targeted ads. It was such a strange pairing that some in Silicon Valley asked if there was a way WhatsApp could have not sold. The answer is no, Brian would later say. I had 50 employees and I had to think about them and the money they would make from this sale. I had to think about our investors and I had to think about my minority stake. I didn't have the full clout to say no if I wanted to. Behind the scenes, WhatsApp had more than doubled its year-over-year -year losses, from losing 54 million to 138 million, mostly because of stock-based compensation. Two years after the acquisition, Facebook gave WhatsApp the green light to drop its subscription fee. 
A month later, WhatsApp reached Facebook's prediction. The app hit 1 billion active users. Two months after hitting this incredible milestone, WhatsApp introduced end-to-end -end encryption, keeping messages on their service secure by refusing to keep plain text logs on their servers so that only the people in a chat can decrypt messages. The relationship between Facebook and WhatsApp soon started to fray. Facebook wanted the app to make money, so Jan and Brian suggested charging registered businesses a small fee to send messages directly to their customers. Facebook insisted that it wouldn't be enough and pushed them to sell targeted ads instead. Then, Facebook ordered WhatsApp to change its terms of service in order to use people's phone numbers to link their accounts on the two services, justifying it as wanting to offer Facebook users better friend suggestions. Jan and Brian had other ideas, however. According to employees, they used an assignment to replicate Snapchat's stories feature inside WhatsApp as an excuse to delay working on generating revenue. Not long after, Brian left. He didn't even take his final batch of Facebook stock, leaving $850 million behind. Six months later, Facebook landed knee-deep in controversy. The social media giant had allowed a data mining company called Cambridge Analytica to obtain the personal information of 87 million users. Cambridge Analytica then used this information to try and sway the 2016 US elections. Brian tweeted a simple message. It is time. Hashtag delete Facebook. One month later, Jan also left WhatsApp. He had been worn down by differences with its parent company. Jan had been against Facebook's insistence on sharing user data and the idea of ads invading the platform. Facebook had also looked at removing end-to-end -end encryption, a move which Jan opposed. Today, WhatsApp is the world's most popular messaging app, having grown to 2 billion users worldwide, double the prediction that drew Mark to the company. WhatsApp has also raised concerns about sharing user data with Facebook, especially since a pop-up alert informed users that the terms of service had been rewritten to reflect the fact that WhatsApp had begun sharing certain user data with Facebook years ago, such as phone numbers. However, WhatsApp does not share contact lists, and thanks to the platform's end-to-end -end encryption, messages are never read by WhatsApp or Facebook staff. And ironically, Facebook decided to monetize the app through Jan and Brian's rejected idea, charging registered businesses instead of introducing targeted ads. If registered businesses do not respond to a user within 24 hours, they are charged a fee for each delayed response, which varies by country. Registered businesses are also charged for large volumes of messages and will later be able to create and manage ads from inside the app. As for WhatsApp's founders, the two set out on different paths after leaving the company. Jan decided to take time off to do things he enjoys outside of technology, such as working on his cars and playing more Ultimate Frisbee. Brian, on the other hand, went straight back into the tech industry and launched Signal, an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app. Signal is one of the most popular apps on the App Store with over 40 million active users and is even promoted by NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden and the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, Elon Musk. This is the story of how a Ukrainian immigrant who lost everything taught himself how to code and created the most popular messaging app in the world, valued at over 1.5 billion. For more interesting stories about today's biggest companies, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.